It's common in our culture for people to sleep together almost as soon as they meet. And a lot of people act like it's fun and it's easy and you can do that with no expectations and only foolish people would expect anything or be unable to handle it, really. So for people who grew up neglected and abused, there's this contradiction. Their attachment wound is crying out for someone to love them and stay and not leave. But the culture of casual sex, which kind of has this very immediate offer of a payoff that somebody will be with you tonight, sets you up to take that need that you have for love and, and push you to give it up and just accept nothing. Now healing this idea that you have to rush in and you can't ask for anything uh, and you have to suppress that need you have inside that you what you really want is to be loved and for somebody to know you and care about you Like suppressing that it's not good for you and it can be healed if you can get real if you can get real and stop Self-sabotaging and make a space in your life where real love can grow. My letter today is from a woman. I'll call Nora and she writes Dear fairy I'm a 38 year old woman and I have CPTSD from growing up in a verbally abusive and emotionally neglectful family. Got the fairy pencil and I'm going to use it to circle things I want to come back to on a second reading, but let's see what's happening for Nora. I've been aware of my CPTSD for several years and have developed some tools and strategies for self-regulation, but an incident 10 days ago really shook me and put me in a bad place mentally. I was dating a guy for a month who I met at a New Year's Eve party, and from the beginning there were red flags I ignored. I pursued him more than he did me. He was vague when he was talking about feelings or plans, and he straight out told me he wanted to keep things casual. Okay, there it is, there it is, that's how he feels. We spent a long weekend together, two weeks after New Year's, and we slept together. I told him I have anxiety and abandonment issues, and I'm trying to be more aware of them and control them, which he seemed to be understanding of. Okay, we're going to come back to that. I got it in my head that he really didn't like me based on how little he was pursuing me and some hot, cold behaviors, and I asked him for reassurance. He would give it to me, but not very earnestly. The last day I saw him, I had driven three hours to see him. He didn't really invite me. I invited myself, <gasps> oh, and he didn't say I should go, okay. When we saw each other, he was not affectionate. He didn't kiss me or try to sit near me. He was friendly enough and was trying to include me in his activities, but I felt like a puppy dog following him around all day. My anxiety spiraled so bad thinking I had made a mistake coming and he wasn't interested in me. And I didn't do very much to try to regulate myself, even though I know tools and strategies that could have helped me in, in the situation. Meditation, going for a walk, helped you like anesthetize you? Okay, we're going to talk about this. In the afternoon, I asked him if he was still interested in spending time with me because he was giving off friend vibes. And the question made him extremely uncomfortable. He didn't answer it one way or another, saying he, he was just being himself and didn't want any bad vibes. I think he misheard me. Hmm. Our interactions got more and more awkward after that point, and it should have been my cue to step back and just remove myself from the situation, at least until my anxiety had calmed down. Uh, but I decided I needed confirmation he didn't like me. So at dinner, I asked him if he would be willing to spend time alone with me instead of partying with his friends. This, of course, made him very uncomfortable, and he basically shut down. I made things even worse by getting upset with him that he couldn't answer a simple question, and we ended up arguing. I begged a little bit for him to still see me. Pathetic, I know, she says. And I finally left. Two days later, I sent him an apology by text, which he accepted graciously, and I haven't spoken to him since. The argument was 10 days ago, and since then, I've been in a deep depression. I'm so ashamed that I treated him the way I did. He really didn't do anything wrong. He was not cruel to me, and he wasn't ignoring me. Considering we'd only known each other a month, he was showing me a healthy level of interest, texting me every few days, liking my posts on social media, remembering little things I'd told him, etc. I've been with narcissists in the past who love bomb me hard, and now I crave that level of intensity early on, even though I know it's not healthy. I totally ignored all the signs that this guy really did like me and that he wanted to spend time with me. He was trying to be helpful and introduce me to his friends. 
He wanted me to go to a party and have fun with him. His only crime was not being affectionate en enough or excited enough to meet my unrealistic expectations. I think he has some avoidant attachment tendencies and was holding back for his own safety and security. We're going to talk about that too. Okay. And I totally ruined any attraction or interest he did feel for me by acting totally unhinged. On the other hand, I wonder if he was just breadcrumbing me and leading me on for his own ego or sex, and he never had any real interest in me at all. Uh, we're going to talk about that. How do I let go of this shame and regret? I should have known better. I completely lost sight of a bigger picture of who I want to be and how I want to behave and what kinds of relationships I want to have. I was so selfish being hyper-focused on having my own needs for validation and certainty and affection met that I completely disregarded him as a human. How he behaves and what he wants. I wasted my own time and money, ruined my own weekend, and damaged my reputation. This was one of the worst incidents of me acting out because of my anxiety and trauma in my whole life, and it comes after years of trying to heal and get better. I'm feeling really hopeless. Also, how can I stop thinking I ruined a good thing with this guy? I keep ruminating over what ifs. What if I had calmed my anxiety and told myself a different story? What if I'd just gone along with the party and tried to have fun? What if I hadn't gone that weekend at all? I, oh, okay, we're going to talk about this too. I try to tell myself if he was the right person for me, he would have been giving me clear, consistent signals and been open to communication. But is that reasonable to expect after only a month? I have been in so many toxic situations that I really don't know what healthy looks like. Okay, there it is. Any guidance you have would be much appreciated. All right, Nora, I got you. I'm so glad you wrote. So Nora, what I really see here is you have a grave attachment wound. It's bad and it's twisting your thinking at crucial moments. This won't really come as good news necessarily, but I want you to completely let yourself off the hook. This idea, I ruined a good thing. It couldn't have been a good thing. I don't know about this guy. We can, we're going to pick apart what happened here, but you are not ready for a relationship. You can't handle what you're doing right now. And what I hear you doing is continuing to fantasize. If I had just not been me and shut down how I really feel and what I really want, it could have been great. And that's true. If we were sex dolls, nobody would ever be mad at us or run away. They couldn't because we would be so agreeable. But you're a human and you're a human who actually wants to be loved. And so one of the things that this, the whole reality just started to go off in a direction that was never going to work for you is that he said he want, he only wanted something casual. And as much as you might have wanted to say yes to that so that you could have you know some time with somebody, some companionship at any cost, what your experience is here just shows like that is not who you are. That's not what you're capable of. That there's no way for you to do that. That once you've had sex with somebody, this is so normal. This is not just trauma, but it's especially harsh because with when we were abused or neglected as kids, we're in the habit of fitting ourselves to that kind of thing. We can say, oh, I really like you. And they go, well, I just want something casual. And you know what that means. He wants sex, but not more. No, no expectation, no commitment, no monogamy. Did you really mean to sign up for that? It doesn't sound like it. And, you know, if you're just like so many of us, we have this part of our brain that just goes, I'll figure it out. I'll shut myself down. I'll make him change. I'll do this. But we have to start listening to people when they tell us where they're coming from. And when, you know, this is what my dating course is all about is it begins. You have to be clear, like, what actually do I want? So when you say that I didn't stand up for my values and what I really want, I was confused because I think you're confused. I didn't know what you meant. It seems like you just went along with his values and what he wanted. So yeah, you had an, a verbally abusive and emotionally neglectful family, very bad combo. What, what's happening here is a very normal sort of consequence in relationships of somebody who grew up like that and hasn't come up with the grown, the healing, hasn't developed a, a healed point of view on it and some workarounds so that your emotional needs you can go into perspective and you don't start, you know, putting them on somebody the minute you sleep with somebody who says, look, this is casual. What that means is it's not going to meet your emotional needs unless you have none. Don't try to have no needs, Nora, don't try. Of course you have needs, of course you do. 
healing from your trauma means becoming honest about who you are and what you want and what you need. You got to be honest about it. And you can't even be honest till you know, but just the evidence of how this made you feel points to casual, not for you, not for you. And that's okay. It's a rare sort of person who really is actually okay with that. So you were dating him for a month and you had asked throughout this, you know, like, is that just too short? Yes, it is. Dating for a month would be like seeing somebody you know, two or three or four times, right? And you're getting to know them. Now for people with attachment wounds where I just see evidence that you have that, where you, you rush in and then you can't get out, you, can't, you stick around after you feel humiliated, that's an attachment wound at work. So I would suggest to you, you need a workaround to go slowly, delay sex. Sex will play tricks on your mind. It will make you attached to somebody you don't actually know yet. It will make you pretend you heard what you wanted to hear when you heard the opposite, when they're telling you where they're coming from. He didn't do anything wrong. He was very open about where he was coming from. So in, in terms of like trying to have a serious relationship, you, it wasn't a good thing. I don't, unless that's what you want. And if you say that's what you want, your, your actions here are telling another story and that's fine. It's totally legitimate to want something deeper than a casual relationship. Okay. So you spent a long weekend together, which also I don't recommend long weekends or long dates when you're just getting to know people, keep it short, keep it short because if you give your attachment wounds a whole weekend, all of it's going to come play out and glom onto the whole thing. You know, that's why you have coffee first. So you met him at a party. Okay. So we'll call that coffee. Then maybe get together for a lunch. Don't even do dinner at first. Don't go to each other's houses. Don't do something that's going to lead to sex till you get to know them a little bit till you have some conversations about, yeah, who are you? What are you, what are you into? What, you know, where are you coming from? So he told you, you did get to know him enough that he just wanted something casual, which was responsible of him to put that on the table. And when you agreed to it, that was, you know, he's not breadcrumbing you. He gave you a casual relationship and it got very weird when you invaded his privacy and showed up on un uninvited. So that's, an, we'll get to that. But you know, he's, he's been very consistent with what he said and um, I don't see anything wrong with what he did. So, but you got a lot of anxiety right away. And I would just posit, I think this is very common for some of us with attachment wounds is that that anxiety and confusion shows up because we're in cognitive dissonance. We're saying we're agreeing to casual, but our everything in our like body and soul are just like not casual at all. You know, we're just like you, you know, I gave you myself. I now want you to give yourself to me. I want to have access to your life. I want to be at your side. Like that's what we want. Now that's not appropriate to decide about somebody so quickly. And there are rare cases where people knew that fast and it worked out. Mostly it doesn't work out for people like us, especially it doesn't work out. It gets us into hot water, gets us into, you know, what I call entanglements, very painful relationships that um, are harmful to our progress in life and are very agonizing to get out of if we can do it or we get, we get abandoned or whatever. It's just, it's, it, it costs us a great deal. Don't want to do that. You want to be going in consciously, um, making a conscious decision with the part of you that cares about what you want and what is in your best interest and not the part of you that's just like, you know, this little child that's just like, I need love. I need it right now. No matter what it costs me, I don't care. I'll take anything I can get. But then that's, this is what happens. Then we hammer them. We're like, I, 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 I expected love. And they're like, I told you that's not what this was. So there we are. I understand. I'm just helping you like reason out what happened here. So yeah, he told you, he just wanted casual. You said, I have anxiety and abandonment issues and I'm trying to be more aware of them and control them. And he seemed understanding. It doesn't matter if he understood it was you who wasn't, you did not take care of your anxiety and your abandonment issues. You went ahead and did things that were a hundred percent certain to make them flare up and make everything terrible for you. So, and it's not reasonable to go on a first date with somebody and spend the weekend and go, listen, I have abandonment issues and expect them to take care of you or not do something that feels like abandonment. He was guaranteed to do something that felt like abandonment. Even if he was into you, even if he wasn't casual, you know, when you have abandonment issues, I know I ha I've had them too. And you, we project them on the situation. So things have to go very slowly and sanely so that there's some basis of a of a, you know, each other. And I'm, you know, some people go, Oh, you say we have to be friends first, but dating is not the same as friends and dating is not the same as sexual entanglement. 
Dating is the getting to know you process. Some people choose to have sex during that time. You don't have to, you don't have to. And yeah, 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 all the people who are like, there's nobody out there who would wait, but there are, you know, all of all the people writing me letters, certainly. So you can wait, you can go more slowly till you have more information, until you've allowed the other person to kind of show you who are you, what are your intentions? Now that you've hung out with me several times, how do you feel about me? So you let people show you, you never have to confront them about their feelings early in dating. You don't want to do that. You want to let them just be themselves and see what that's like. Because if they can't, if they're not very emotionally available, that's good information. That means go, don't do this one. Okay. When you say, this is where you abandon yourself, Nora. I told him I had anxiety and abandonment issues and I'm trying to be more aware and control them, but you mean obliterate them. And how do I just know that in your childhood that what your parents hoped for is that your emotional needs would just go away, that you got indoctrinated, that this was what we, you were doing wrong is having needs of having expectations of needing actual time and attention from your parents. This is how it shows up is in this weird self attack. So then you go, here, I have this problem. You take care of it. You take responsibility for it. Well, they don't. And he even told you that's not going to happen. So you basically kind of just threw yourself off the ship there of just like, you're going to have a, you're throwing, you're abandoning yourself into a, a sea where nobody takes care of you where nobody cares that you feel that way. So don't do that. Stay on the deck, take care of yourself. Don't give yourself away so quickly. You can get to know people and just believe me, there are people who will love you and care about you and be patient with you and be aware of your issues and be considerate about them. You know, I'm not healthy. People are not going to take, take us on when we're not healed at all. There needs to be some healing. There needs to be some sense of ownership. Like I t I'm taking care of this, but how you deal with it when you have abandonment issues is you don't, you know, throw yourself out there to get attached to somebody who's already told you they're not going to stay. Okay. So you said, I got it in my head that he really didn't like me based on how little he was pursuing me. So you might be twisting that a little bit. The way you know that if somebody is interested is if they don't pursue you very much. So he didn't. So that meant he wasn't that excited about you. It doesn't mean he didn't like you. It just meant given that he wants something casual and given the way things had played out, it wasn't inspiring him to try to run after you and try to get things going with you. He wanted something casual. That means maybe occasional, maybe there's no emotional obligation. He had some hot and cold behaviors. And I'm, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt and say, because, because you were in dissonance and you were like simultaneously saying casual, great, I can do that. And then being really anxious and having abandonment wounds coming up. And you said, I asked him for reassurance, reassurance of what? of what he wants something casual. There's nothing he could have reassured you. So he gave it to you, but not very earnestly. And so I would clock him as he's, he's somebody afraid of hurting you. He doesn't want confrontation, but he figured out pretty early on that your needs were way out of scale with what he was available to give. And when you're doing that, you will see people try to help you out, but not give you that love that you want. And I, I, you know, we don't know him well enough to really know what the full story of that was, but that's how I think I would feel if somebody were rushing in, even though I said, don't rush in, I would start to feel like, Whoa, you, you, you're trying to get a boundary. You're trying to get emotional distance. It can be uncomfortable and alarming and, and it actually can get scary. You know, like you don't really know, like how far is this going to go where somebody's not saying one thing, but doing another, it, it can be kind of frightening emotionally. So the last day I saw him, I went three hours. He didn't really invite me. I invited myself and he didn't say I should go. So right there, I feel like you glossed over what that was. That was, that was not a good thing. And you feel guilty. And I, I don't want you to, it's like you feeling ashamed of yourself is not serving you right now. You feeling in a, like, let's look at what happened here and see what, how healing would look for you so that you could do things differently next time. You, everything that you've done is somebody with an attachment wound completely running the show and overriding logical information. This is part of how our brain is wounded by trauma. So it's totally understandable that this happened to you, but you're writing. I know you're writing because you want to get some perspective. It's like, but really what just happened here? So going three hours to see somebody when you're not invited and basically just like showing up at their door, 
that's that's a that's a way to cause somebody to be scared and uncomfortable even more. So that took it up to the next level. And still he tried to be nice and but he didn't want to kiss you. He didn't want to sit near you. He's trying to figure out how to have some kind of boundary with somebody who's not getting the memo of like, hey, I'm, you know, for all you know, because this is a casual relationship. He had a date with somebody. Maybe he had already had somebody at his place, which would be his right, given that he was clear that this was casual. See, I don't, I don't like, I don't do casual. And there was a time in my life when I thought that's what I had to do, but it just like killed me. <laughs> I hated it. And so finally I got honest, like I just wouldn't get into something where somebody was casual. It takes time. It takes time to get to know somebody and get, get to where the, you know, when you're actually like sleeping with them, that you actually know that they care about you. They're committed to you. They are going to be there emotionally. If any, if you start crying, right, that could happen. A lot of people don't want to hear that and they think it's too old fashioned. It's like, well, to those people, I just say, do what you're going to do. But I'm writing to Nora. I'm writing to Nora and what Nora is struggling with and what a lot of people who had attachment wounds suffer with, which I know about because because I've had them too, and I straightened it out. So I'm just telling you, this is how you do it. You have to get like really honest with yourself and you have to sacrifice that sort of insta romance that can be a quick fix against the depression and the loneliness of not having anybody. And it, it's very seductive. The idea, oh, you know, if I just go along with this casual plan, I'll have a boyfriend for the weekend. It's kind of like doing drugs or something. You know, you'll be high for a weekend, but then it's going to be terrible. And then you're going to want more. And then the worst side of you is going to come out and your life will get derailed and it's not worth it. Here you go gaslighting yourself again is where you go. Um, my anxiety spiraled so badly. I made a mistake. I thought I was making made a mistake coming. You, you flat out did make a mistake. No matter how you felt, it was a mistake. You didn't have his consent to come visit. And that's very important. And he wasn't interested and that you didn't do very much to try to regulate yourself. So regulating yourself, it's not a card trick that you use to shut down how you actually feel and what you actually need and who you are so that you can go along with somebody's casual agenda. That's not what regulation is. In fact, regulation would help you be more honest with yourself. Being regulated and doing something that went against everything that you are and want would actually make you feel like crap. Okay. Regulation would allow you to feel that honestly, like, oh, yuck. I don't want this horrors. That's regulation is not a tool to shut yourself down like a drug. So all this like breathing and meditation and walking and everything, tools and strategies, it's, we don't do it so that we can be appropriate for somebody else's agenda. We do it so we can be honestly, authentically ourselves needs and all weepy little parts of our issues and all we, we become ourselves and you cannot honor and protect and heal yourself until you actually can feel yourself and you quit lying about what that is so somebody won't leave you on some crappy hangout that you have going on. A little tip I'm going to insert here, healing from this kind of relationship trouble is always going to involve a way to be happy and comforted and with friends whenever you need it. And to do that, like a lot of people with attachment wounds don't have the friends, the friends are sparse. So it's so important when you're not in a relationship and when you are in a relationship to have friends. And for me, that all shifted when I got into 12 step recovery for families of alcoholics. I had, I had somewhere to go any night, any Saturday morning where I needed to be with people and I could talk to them and say, Hey, anybody want to go get coffee? So I always had companionship when necessary. And that saved me from a life of misery, you know, having to try to chase that in some man and allowed me to go slowly. It allowed me to be single for long periods of time while I sorted things out for myself and to be happy while it was happening. So, and to have perspective, not only that, but 12 step recovery is a way to, to recover. It's a way to start, you know, getting honest and real and educated about what's going on with you to witness other people who have similar issues and how they have a bad day or a good day or a victory or a failure. Like we help each other by learning from each other. All right. So then you did all of that, but you didn't even use your tools, but you're just saying I, I failed to shut down how I really feel. Good. I'm glad. I'm glad how you really feel just blew the situation up. It was not tenable for you. In the afternoon, I asked him if he was still interested in spending time because he was giving off friend vibes and the question made him uncomfortable. Yeah, right there, right there. Well, you know, you should have, you shouldn't have come. And once you realized it was wrong, you should have left. He didn't answer one way or the other. 
he said, I'm just being myself. I don't want bad vibes. Yeah, he didn't want to hurt you. So he cared about you enough or, or he was a chicken. But <laughs> maybe he should have just said flat out, look, this is weird. I can't do this. And um, you think he misheard you. I don't think he did. I think your actions were very clear. And you said in, interactions were getting more and more awkward. So he couldn't, he, he was afraid to set a boundary. And it should have been your cue. And and then you thought, oh, I should have stepped back at least till my anxiety calmed down. But your anxiety wasn't the problem. Your anxiety was the honest truth about how you felt. So it wasn't going to calm down. You were in a weird situation. You had sort of like, you know, your, your trauma injury had sort of driven you into a weird situation. And then you got confused and didn't know how to resolve it. Welcome to the club, sister. You know, we've all been there. <laughs> So, and then you wanted confirmation he didn't like you. Okay, trauma-driven move, I get it. So then you asked if he would give up his plans and just hang out with you, and he shut down, uh-huh. And then you got upset with him that he couldn't answer one simple question. And so that's often the last vestige of our trauma wound is it gets, it, when it can't get the love that it wants, it starts to get self-righteous. It's like, you're breadcrumbing me. You can't answer a question. But I, I'm not seeing that. I think he was trying to be as polite as he could, given that you just showed up at his door. So then it got ugly and you begged to see him. You feel ashamed. It's okay. Don't worry. We've all done it. It's okay. It is soon forgotten. And then you finally left. And two days later, you apologized by text and he was gracious. So good, good guy. And you haven't spoken since. And now it's 10 days ago and you're depressed. And it's, I understand. It's okay. Depression is a sadness that is appropriate because your trauma, it's here. It's causing pain. It's sad. Now, I don't want you to stay depressed, but it's okay to feel sad and embarrassed. It, those are just natural feelings. It's okay. And the pattern that you're showing is something so common for someone who has been emotionally neglected. So it's okay. It's okay. You're never going to see him again, I think. So don't worry. You've apologized. You did your part with him. So now you're just dealing with you and what you really want and how you didn't get what you really wanted and how you acted when everything was, went the way it went. You're, you are saying you feel ashamed and you feel bad how you treat him. Don't worry. He's a guy who would like to have casual relationships. And this is all for his education to be like, you know, maybe you need to get to know people a little better before you accept, oh yeah, it's casual as an answer. I've been on that side of it too. And I've learned that just telling somebody, look, I'm not interested in this being a relationship, but just wanting them around anyway, they'll say yes, but then they get like emotionally destroyed. I've done that to people. I've been that the, the person who's destroyed. I no longer believe that just saying that you don't want a relationship with somebody who clearly does or who, if you got to know them, you'd realize that they do. It's not right. It's ripping somebody off. So he got what he got from his behavior. You got what you got from your behavior. There's no harm done. All right. So I would just really encourage you, let him go. If he ever wants to see you again, I'm sure he'll get in touch, but I strongly suggest do not contact that man. Don't contact him. That your, your apology to him is to not do that anymore. And it, you, you'll find it will allow you to heal faster. Don't, don't let the, you know, your trauma wound will play tricks on your mind and go, no, actually, I need to say something else. No, actually, I think we could be friends. No, I, it's your trauma wound talking. It's just, you had your experience. Like, what can happen with me and this other human being? You had that experience. It sucked. It was awful. Okay. When it's a good match for you, it's going to feel good and uplifting for both of you. At least some in the beginning. Sometimes things get off to a rough start, but there's just so much evidence here. Like, it's time for you to heal, Nora. It's time for you to do that. Yeah, you're right. He wasn't cruel and you're blaming yourself for craving intensity. Don't don't even bother bl blaming yourself. It goes with the territory of being growing up neglected. It's not your fault. It's just like a it's a wound that you carry that you now have to protect and defend. You have to go slowly. You have to communicate clearly and you need emotional support from other women who get it. When to, when we get together, and men with men, women with women, generally speaking, and I'm just, you know, if people are straight, that's, it's just so that you're not trying to get your emotional support from somebody who's secretly in love or you're secretly in love with them. We just need friends, friends who get it, friends who are walking the path of recovery and they can help you and you can go, I want to call them and they can go, no, don't call them. Come over here. Come on. We'll have a grilled cheese sandwich, right? That's what you need. You need actual love and support. When you go to somebody who 
you know, didn't give that to you before thinking this time it'll be different. It's what we call going to the hardware store for milk. It's not a good, there's no milk. You won't get what you want. And then, then comes even more depression. So just close that wound that's making you depressed right now and start doing the things that are healing for you. So yeah, he did show signs of liking you. He didn't know you yet. You were masquerading as somebody who was totally fine with casual. So, it, you know, it sounded good to him. And, you know, he tried to be polite to you and he withdrew. And then there's this weird twist. And I see this. This is the what I call the limerent twist where you start to think I have to have him. And maybe instead of him rejecting me and just it getting weird because he was too polite to make me leave, but it, he clearly didn't want you there. Then you go, he has avoidant attachment tendencies. Well, I doubt you know that after one weekend with him. I doubt you know that. Um, I think he doesn't want a relationship with anybody or possibly just you. And I want you to just let that in. He might have perfectly good ability to attach. He, and you say he was holding back for his own safety and security, also because it's not what he wanted. Also because in his knowledge of himself, it's not what he wanted. That's, we want everybody to be able to at, know what they want and to seek it out and to behave consistently with what they want. So he's doing it, now you get to do it for yourself and your template is different. And you said, I ruined any attraction and by appearing unhinged. And it's not just about how he feels about you or it would have been great. It's not just about that. It's just that for you, the reality of being around him was a very upsetting reality uh, that didn't feel good at all. And sometimes those of us who grew up neglected, like we can't really get that perspective of like, I feel like crap when I spend time with this person. I feel really unloved. That is how you feel. That's why we date is to find out how does this feel? You know, how is this? How do they feel? What, in, what do we end up doing in our, with our lives when we spend time together? And then you said, I wonder if he was just breadcrumbing you. I don't think he was. I don't think he was. He had a weekend with you. He had a casual fling with you, which is what he said. So maybe you were breadcrumbing yourself by saying yes to it and then thinking you could change yourself to make that work. It's okay. I, you know, I'm famous for, <laughs> I'm very direct with people. I'm like, no, I think you breadcrumbed yourself. I think you abandoned yourself. I think you crap fitted. You tried to make yourself into somebody who he would date. Even if you had to give up everything you wanted, you couldn't do it. So it's okay. It's just not you. This relationship is not you. So it's okay. There's nothing more you need to do for him. It's all for you now. And you're right. You don't know yet what healthy looks like. So this is how we do it. You need tools. You need tools to cope with all the feelings that come up. You need tools that help deal with feelings of shame and guilt and blame, attack of yourself or other people, so that you can start to make sense of what happened. And instead of just feeling forever against yourself or in danger of other people hurting you, you start to have boundaries. You start to have self-knowledge. You have ways to get, in, to get to know people and to get out if it's not what you wanted. And so tools, and friends who support you. Those are the two essentials for you and a willingness to be honest with all of that. So I recommend 12-step programs. If you like, you can come into my membership program. We function in that way. We have a private Facebook group where people give each other a lot of support and raise questions and ask for advice from each other. They get all kinds of advice, of course. We have peer-led daily practice calls throughout the day. If you just want to put your toe into what we do here, sign up for my free course on the daily practice and learn how we in this program free ourselves of the fearful, resentful thinking that gets us so wound up and separate from ourselves. And then see what you like, if you like it, if you like it, come to one of the free calls that we have every week where we do the techniques together and take questions. We're super invested in anybody who wants to learn these techniques to come learn them well. And then if you really like it, take a course with us, come to a workshop, you know, come to the membership where you can access all the courses. You can do that. But one thing, that I do think is really important is face-to-face -face contact with friends. So if you don't have enough friends, um, some programs that you might qualify for is definitely Sex and Love Addicts, Adult Children of Alcoholics and Other Dysfunctional Families, ACA. If you had alcoholism in your family, definitely Al-Anon. These are 12-step programs where you can meet people who are earnestly working on themselves. You can learn so much and you can feel the peace of like not being judged for who you are and what's hard for you. It's so good when other people are around who get it, especially when they can show you a few things that help them. So I hope that helps. 
In the meantime, to get a vision of what's possible for you out in front of you, I have a list of things that you can do to get your life ready for a great relationship um, in yourself. And I've listed them on a PDF. You can download it for free right there. And I will see you very soon.